Hello again there, neighbors and naysayers. This is Clint Finney again for another Eastern Ohio Grazing Council virtual pasture walk for July the 23rd, 2020. This month, we've uh, went and visited the farm of Sean and Beth Doherty, otherwise known as the Sows here. If uh, you're a frequent flyer with the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council, we went to their other farm a couple years ago up the road that the sisters owned. It happened to be my grandfather's old farm. And uh, since we're doing this virtually, we decided to go down to their home farm because it's a smaller operation and uh, parking would be a premium if we had the whole group down there. So this was a good opportunity to show you all what they've got going on at the home farm. So let's get started. I wanted to start out with a slide just showing you the overall topography and kind of terrain of the home farm there. Uh, very steep, uh, has a creek that flows down through the center of it. Um, not a, a, a big question of why they call the farm the sow's ear. The old saying that you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Uh, and this farm was very overgrown when they purchased it, um, mostly in monoflower rose and other brush and, and woody species. and uh, probably some Japanese knotweed because Japanese knotweed is still a part of their operation, uh, but they've turned this operation into a, a grazing operation, turned this area back to a pastoral type setting uh, just through their management. And uh, I've got another slide here that's going to go through it and talk in their own words of what they're doing there at their farm and why they're doing the things they do. Um, but Overall, their their goals are food sustainability, and that's different from most of the producers we work for. Uh, we were there and talked, and, and we laughed about uh, um, a previous pasture walk. Uh, Pete Conkle mentioned everybody wants to wear the big sombrero and have lots of cows, and and that couldn't be further from the truth of their operation. Their their goals are food sustainability, uh, producing their family's food from the farm. And then also uh, not many off the farm inputs to the operation to sustain the, the operation that they have. So those are wholly different goals than a lot of the producers we work for, although lofty goals. It's a, it's a great mindset that they have in let's produce our family's food first. Let's produce the living that we want to have first and worry about the off the farm sales later in the process. And it makes for an enjoyable operation for them and their family. So our goal for, for this place and the other place has been to see what you can do coming onto a, a junky, trash piece of land, which is all we can afford and all most people can afford, and it's what's out there sitting begging to be used, and introduce all the, all the companion species we want, things like pigs that we like to eat and chickens, all, all, the, all our favorite species of plant and animal, including us, and not displace what's already there, because if, we, if anything we get rid of, we have to figure out what it was doing, how it was serving us, and then how we're going to supply that service now that we've gotten rid of a species. So we want to come on and coexist with what's there, whatever it is. It's, it's an ecosystem. It's kind of functional, right? And um, and see if it'll feed us and our animals. But but one of the things that we learned is that you can't start off saying this is what I want to be. You have to start off by letting the land tell you what it can do. So you don't. If you want to end up with cows, you don't start with cows necessarily. You may have to start with goats, or you may have to start with sheep because that's what your land is for. I mean, is will feed. And then gradually you move to the other. And it wants to go there. That's the thing that we've been excited about, is we started with goats, and I didn't. I don't he hates care goats. for goats. And I don't care for goat milk. And I wanted cow milk. and But it, by bringing the goats in, now it's ready for cows. As you can see, them over there eating. When I was um, that it's hard to call that pasture in one sense. When I was um when I was moving the cows yesterday and watching what they were doing, I I walked over to the garden afterward and I thought, well, oh, the potatoes are going to have a hard time this year. Some of these things are going to make, and some of them aren't. And I thought, but out there in the pasture where I have 
what? What do I have? 200 species of plants? Okay. 200 species. Of that 200, there's always going to be something making. Whatever the climate does, whatever the rain does, there's something making. And she's what can turn it into food for everybody else on the farm. A dairy cow, in real time, is going to turn it into something that we can use to feed everybody else while not disturbing and not fighting with and not opposing and getting in the way of the species that want to grow. And in a year like this where we're, it's hot, we're not getting rain, and my garden isn't going to... Like, I've got beautiful tomato plants, but marry a tomato right now. But the Those thing are things that... You know, what do we grow? Like 15 species of garden plants. I don't know if they're going to like this year. But that pasture is full of plants that already know all about this, this climate, this topography. And it's just a question of how do we turn that into food and fertility. The other thing that we love about the milk cow is that we're harvesting every day. And yeah, we, right don't, day. we don't stop in the winter, even in the cold part of the winter, we go ahead and harvest. We know that the production's way down, but we know that when she comes back in in the spring, and we really had that this spring, mm -hmm. she goes way down in the winter, especially in the cold part of the winter. But when spring comes on and she gets on that, her production goes way up. It's super interesting to watch the cows and the chickens because you see, you know, like if you go to a book and you say, how with the cow's production look like over the course of a lactation. I'll show you more or less, you know, two-thirds of a bell curve, right? It goes up a bit, and then it comes down in a steep curve. Well, that's for grained animals that are being fed to maximize production, kept under very controlled conditions, right? That has nothing to do with what a cow is going to do on grass. And you watch them, their production is the exact reflection of how much protein they're getting. And it can go down to I kid you not, a cow can produce four pounds a day for a month in March, and as the grass comes on in April, she can go back up to 24. Mm -hmm. She can just go right up. And the chickens are the same way. Since they're on, since they're, the ration we provide them is, is sprouted or fermented wheat primarily, you, depending on what they're getting as a protein supplement and how much there is of it, there they just follow that and it'll go up and down according to what the farm will produce. The natural cycle of things. So if mm -hmm. there's um, like butchering waste or what there is mostly is milk, the more they get of it, the more eggs you get. And the less they get of it, the eggs go down. But they won't, you're not, a, it's not a one way street where if you don't keep them in a certain, at a certain level of production, um, you're losing ground that you can't regain. It really is just. They're going to follow the weather cycle. They're going to follow the cycle of the other animals. And um, that's been a huge relief to us because uh, I, think, I think we started out feeling that we always had our tail in a crack. Like, if we don't get this right, the results are just going to keep deteriorating. And the opposite has been what we found, that we don't really have to know what we're doing if we don't get in the way of this, which does know what it's doing. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it was a huge relief because, you know, you, you have bad things happen. Calves die and you think, that was me. I don't know what I'm doing. And then the next one lives. And if you stay out of the way, you realize, no, you're really not the most important part of this picture. <laughs> and it, it'll kind of do its own thing and work pretty well if you can just stay out of the way and then use fence to put everybody where they'll do the, the most good most of the time. And the other thing we just love is that this is all free. I mean, yeah. we don't give our cows any grain whatsoever. So there is no purchase. You know, the purchase of the animal, and that's it. After that, you know, if you're, if you're handling them right, and that's one of our, in our experimentation, that's one of our goals is on pasture all year round. Now that's the ruminants. Right. So the ruminants, we keep we overwinter about 14 animal equivalents, probably closer to 18 animals with little calves. And in the course of the winter, we may go through, depending on the winter, somewhere between 300 and 800 bales, square bales. Mm -hmm. um, because we're mostly feeding hay when there's ice on top of snow or way late in the winter when I just don't feel comfortable letting them be out on the pasture anymore. Um, so there, we buy a little bit, 
I would figure they'd go through maybe $1,500 worth of hay in a year, but that's a total of, including the summer animals, probably 25 animals over the course of the year, and taking milk out of them. They're, for, for the services they're providing, I can't even count that money against them. Mm -hmm. Wanted to give you the other view. This is from the other end of the valley, looking back up uh, through the field. And you can see the back end of the barn there that I showed in the first view. But again, very steep terrain. Um, there's about three different paddocks along this hill slope that run up that run up the valley, uh, and they can break those paddocks down into smaller paddocks to graze with the sheep and the dairy cow and the calves and whatever else they've got grazing there on the operation. Uh, they've got water supplied through all of it, and we'll talk about the water later on. But just wanted to give you an idea for the kind of area they're talking about. And, and by all means, they could do a, a better job at telling you all the ins and outs and, and buying the farm and, and looking at all the other operations. We've had many, many conversations with them about it. You know, this is the farm that they could afford at the time that they were looking for somewhere to leave the city and, and move out into the country. And so they've, they've taken this piece of property that was overgrown and, and pretty much deemed non-farmable and, and turned it into a thriving grazing operation. As I was putting this presentation together, I guess I realized that no uh, NRCS Natural Resource Conservation Service uh, presentation would be complete without uh, looking back at the, the old aerial and the, the today's aerial of the property to kind of show the changes in what's been done out there. And we've got the still pictures to show you what's actually out there, but you know, we here at NRCS have the mapping ability and and to be able to go back and, and show what the farm looked like here in 1989 and then again in 2019 and realizing that the 89 picture is black and white and the, the 19 pictures in, in color, but uh, you can really see uh, the activity there. Um, I'm not sure that you can, that the average observer can tell how much brush was there before, but I can see it, that there was brush there and there is now pasture there, but also, uh, the house can clearly be seen in the 2019 area. You can see the garden, you can see the, the bar, and you can see that there's activity that there, that there's life there on that piece of, of land and and life that's producing life, I guess, so to speak. So uh, it, it's a, a good way for us at NRCS and the Solar Water Conservation Districts to, to look at what was there and, and what is there and, and what could be there. And, you know, we've got the ability to put topographical lines on there, but this farm is so steep, the topographical lines would be stacked on top of each other and soils maps to be able to look at and see what the productivity of the soil. And Beth and Sean are, are well known for saying that the, the soil survey in their area says that uh, it, it shouldn't be farmed, but here they are doing it and doing a good job of it. So just a, a good aerial view uh, of what they've got going on at their operation. One of the interesting parts about going there and doing a virtual pasture walk with them is knowing when I left that I was not going to be able to do their operation justice. And I say that because they're, they're a very interesting family. They've got interesting ideas and, and, and they've got a, a conviction for what they do and how they do it. And they've also written a, a book about what they do there on the farm and, and it's been published and, and out there widely in the homesteading um, and, and food movement uh, type folks. And uh, Sean and Beth have been invited to lots of conferences to talk about what they do and how they do it. And uh, I knew that, that what I was going to do there was not going to do justice for, for the book and, and for all of their speaking engagements and, and for their fans, really, that, that go to see them speak at conferences. Uh, to be able to show them what's going on there at the farm. But I hope this opens a little piece in, into their operation and, and what they do. And if you're one of those people who likes YouTube videos and likes watching things and want to get a better idea uh, for what they do there at their farm, there's a whole series of videos from the, the Living Web Farm 
that they did down there. I think there's six videos in the series and, and they're a really good listen. They're, they're a really good resource to, to what they do there at their operation. But uh, I, I'm, I'm taking their stuff and putting it in my own words and what I see and, and their farm, as I said, is, is based off of food sustainability. But taking those and breaking them down to their tenants, we get free sunshine. Uh, we hopefully get free rain and the grass grows. And from there, they take those products and turn them into something that their family can, can use. And, and for them, it really all starts with a dairy animal. Um, they, they use that sunshine and rain and grass and feed a dairy cow, milk that dairy cow twice a day uh, to be able to use the dairy products, not only in their home, but also for other things. They use it to, to feed the pigs if it's waste. Uh, they make cheese and they make all kinds of other products out of the dairy. Uh, the, the, some of the milk, I'm sure, gets to go in with the chickens and um, used for them. So it's kind of the driver then that, that drives the whole rest of the system and the way they work the system. This particular picture here is a nurse cow. Um, this is a, a dairy cow that uh, Sean Beth told me developed a propensity to kick. And so she got to be a, a nurse cow and feed the calves. And we've got other pictures here, the calves as we go along, but that's her job there. Instead of producing milk for the family, she's raising the, family, raising the next generation cows for their operation. As always, Beth takes the pictures when we're out there at the, the farm sites. And uh, I, I made a comment to Sean and Beth at how awesome these two or these set of dairy calves look. Um, when you go to, to dairy operations, if you see a group of calves that look this good, that that's an exception and not the rule. Uh, got great hair coats on them. They're, they've been exposed to pasture, and it just goes to them being an, uh, on a nurse in a nurse cow environment. I mean, they're, I think they're supplementing these calves a little bit to, with the bottle. Maybe maybe one of them is only on a bottle, but um, just goes to show the quality of, of calves that can be raised on a bottle. And, and most of us are beef producers. Most of us have raised calves on a bottle before, and we know that those calves just never end up where they need to be um, because they just didn't ever get what what mom would have produced and uh, they, they've got a system there with a, with a nurse cow and, and the other milk that they, they feed those calves and they, they really look good and they, they do a good job of, of getting them and, and that went to a further conversation that we had with them about you know when they first started with dairy calves, they had trouble and, and their calves looked like, you know, the dairy calves that I'm talking about. They were kind of slow and, and hard doing. And over the years, their management has, has improved, but also their forage has improved because of the management and, and their genetics have improved. You know, they've kept cows that, that were going to flourish in their system and they produce calves that now flourish in their system. And, and so often, I don't think that we, we talk about that enough uh, for it, it takes some time sometimes to get things turned around, not only in our forage and, and their operation certainly is a, a picture of how you can turn an operation around from brush to, to grass and forage, but also in our genetic makeup in the animals that will, will flourish in our system. Well, we're on the calves and talking about them. These calves are largely Jersey influence, but also has some Dexter in them. Um, Sean and Beth have incorporated some Dexter cattle into their, their jerseys. And I guess it's important to point out that uh, they're not only dairy calves, they, they're, they're heifers by and large, but they raise all of their calves, be they heifers or steers, and they process grass-fed beef uh, from the farm for their family to use. So those dairy animals, I guess, we see them as dairy animals. Those of us that are beef producers are more conventional type producers, uh, but these are dual purpose cattle and, and they produce milk and, and eventually produce meat uh, for the family and, and for the folks that are involved with their operation. So just good to point out that we're only producing dairy on this farm, but we're also producing beef. After we talk about the dairy cows there at Sean and Bess, I think the next 
step down is to talk about the pigs that they have and use there at their farm. And those of you that are purists to the, the pasture walks are saying, well, these, these hogs aren't in pasture. They're out in, they're in a barn. But uh, Sean and Beth use pigs as, as Alan Nation used to put it, the original mortgage lifters of the farm. They take uh, products that are not usable to humans or to ruminants or maybe even the poultry and turn it into a product that is usable for the humans. So these hogs get uh, waste milk, they get waste uh, from cheese making and other things that have to do with the milk. Um, they also are used as compost turners and we had a long conversation when, when we were there about uh, pigs with jobs and using pigs for certain things and they do use them for compost turners. Uh, but basically the pigs are there to, to take a product that is not usable by humans and turn it into a product that is usable by humans. And, and whether that means that they're on pasture or turning compost in the barn consuming that. Now, Sean and Beth also do raise some garden produce that is raised specific, specifically for the pigs. Uh, we'll talk about that here as we go along and, and what things that they do, but they basically get garden waste and milk and uh, are there to compost, turn compost. And, and the added benefit of that is that they produce delicious pork. And I guess part of what Sean and Beth do is, is, is use the animal to their potential to generate the farm landscape that they desire. Uh, they, they're um, advocates of using ruminants to, to be able to turn areas into pasture and uh, hogs to, to be able to turn products that aren't usable into a product that is usable. And we're going to talk about the chickens here in the future. Uh, but just a, a good part of their operation are these hogs. Now, uh, those of you that know me know that I raise hogs. And, and those of you that know I raise hogs know that these two pigs came from my farm. Uh, I am an avid spotted hog and Tamworth breeder. Uh, these two are, are from my place, and this is no as an advertisement. Um, Sean and Beth, when, when they need pigs, they give me a call, and if I've got a group that's ready that can go to their house, then they come and get them from me. But if I don't have any pigs ready, they go find hogs from somewhere else, because when they need a pig, they need a pig, and they need one right now. Um, these hogs are, are here to take over a, a supply of extra milk or a supply of garden produce. And, and so that stuff's gonna go bad quick. So they've gotta have an animal that's there and ready to eat it. They don't use commercial feed. They don't, they don't buy in feed for these hogs. So they have to be there when that product is, is ready for them to, to have. But just wanted to say, I, I'm not in any way trying to advertise my, my own operation. Uh, these just happen to be the pigs that they have there at their place right now. As I talk with Sean and Beth, kind of the next step down in the chain is is the the chickens, and some of you may be saying I, I'm I'm showing my bias when I put the pigs ahead of the, the chickens, but um, the, the chickens are there, of course, to produce eggs. Um, they've got several different ways that they manage the chickens. This is a chicken tractor, kind of chicken coop, uh, what what. Joe Salton would call an egg mobile, uh, but they've also got chicken tractors and, and they've got a stationary coop, even if they said they told me they don't like because it becomes a dirt chicken yard. Um, but Beth uses chickens to uh, harvest buckwheat, the cover crops that they plant on their gardens. Uh, if they let it go just right, the buckwheat will seed, replant the next crop of buckwheat that the chickens can go through. But the chickens, uh, at least at this place, uh, typically are around the gardens and they're used in some way uh, to control things that, that happen in their garden. Now, I will say this picture was taken up at the sister's farm, uh, but there are, there are chickens down at the sow's ear farm, the one that we're really, we're really highlighting today. Um, but they all kind of have a job and, and they have a job to do, but also to produce eggs and meat uh, for their family. As promised, some poultry pictures from down at the sow's ear. Uh, these are just a free ranging set of chickens uh, running around, picking out bugs and things out of the pasture. Um, they're shut up at night and, and, and let out every morning to go out and just cruise the pastures of, of the sow's ear farm. 
and, and be able to sustain most of their need off of the pasture. But they also get, again, scraps and, and they use fermented wheat and some other things uh, to be able to feed the chickens. But there again, the goal here is is food sustainability. And so they've got that's why they've got the different species of animals to help supply food for the family. I talked with the pigs about some of the garden produce being raised solely for pig feed. And these are pictures of what Beth calls mangle wurzels. Um, and they're basically a beet. Uh, they grow really big though, like a radish would grow. And, and in conversations with them, I, I always wonder why do we not grow this as a cover crop? It's, it's sugary, um, it, would, it would make great cover crop and great for soil health and good for compaction. And, and as we talked, I think one of the reasons why we never consider it or we've never been talked to about it for a cover crop is it has a very irregular seed like a beet would have. If any of you ever planted beets from seed, you know that their seeds are really irregular. Uh, you may have one seed in a cluster, or you may have five. And so it, it doesn't lend itself to commercial seeding equipment. But Beth found these mangle wurzels and has been raising them for several, several years. And these are harvested then and stored to use as pig feed to get them through times when they may not have the production from the gardens or from milk or from other things to be able to feed the hogs or the group of hogs that they have. And, and, and of course, they use it probably daily when they're when they're ready, but they can really put a, a group of hogs on these mangle wurzels, tops and, and roots uh, to be able to keep them going in a time of need. And then a picture of their hair sheep flock from there at the sow's ear. I think they've they've at times had more sheep and at times had less sheep, but uh, the sheep for them are, are sort of weed control down there at the sow's ear end of things. If you've been watching some of the pictures, they've got Japanese knotweed. Um, they call it river weed, but Japanese knotweed that, that will just invade an area coming up, especially from those river areas. Uh, from right here at this farm, you're probably less than half a mile from the Ohio River down the creek. Of course, you got the city of Toronto in the way. And so you've got lots of unmowed and unmaintained areas around Route 7 and Toronto and, and that Japanese knotweed just flourishes in those areas. So they've got it kind of invading the farm, but they've been able to beat that back uh, with the, the sheep. And, and they showed us an area that was solid Japanese knotweed, but it was young and, and not mature for this time of year, that's odd. And it's because they grazed the sheep through it three or four times this, this spring and summer, and they've kept it down. And and that's even to the point where, you know, Japanese knotweed is invasive, but she says, it's invasive, but it's sheep feed, it's forage. And, and I can't really try to, to remove it from the system with grazing because it does provide a forage for those sheep and, and it grows in areas uh, where a lot of times other things won't grow. Now, we had a conversation too, though, about it, it's a great ground cover, but it's not great for soil erosion purposes because it doesn't have a, a, a large root system, doesn't really cover the ground at the soil surface. So it, it's just like kudzu and other things that grow in other parts of the world. Uh, it has a great ground cover, but we have to really be concerned about erosion underneath. So, you know, the goal here is to get rid of the, the Japanese knotweed if possible, but to do it with livestock and, and be able to, to find that right mix of grazing and how to graze it and when to graze it, to be able to, to remove it from the system and get good forage, good grass growing on those areas. I know I've sort of already shown this view, maybe just a little bit different angle uh, of their operation, but as I was going over the slides and looking at the pictures and thought, you know, we've, we've talked about the, their goals and, and what they would like to do. And maybe we haven't focused enough on the grazing and, and what they do there. So uh, at this operation with the sheep and the nurse cow and the calves, pretty much everything's moved daily or, or as needed. Uh, and, and when I say as needed, I say that's less than daily. Uh, if the area is small, they're moved when they need to be moved because their house is just up the end of the valley and they're able to walk down there and, and move livestock whenever they need to. Uh, we really didn't get into to talking about how often they were moved. I, I guess we we just assumed that they were moved when they needed and, and whatever paddock size they were given and 
some of the slides there were the nurse cow around some fruit tree plantings and they've got other plantings around scattered along the farm that are for different things and and they they just manage the animals as needed to be able to get those areas grazed and keep the weeds at bay and, and also to, to transition the farm to continually transition the farm uh, from weeds and brush to forage species and, and I can't tell you what the difference is in this farm. I don't remember how many years ago it was that I walked through here. Uh, it's been several though uh, and just the difference now in what the forage was from then to now and that's something that Beth and I talk a lot about um, back and forth over email and I'm sure Sean has input in this too is just the change in in how our management can affect our pastures and, and our forage composition and uh, every spring I think we're all surprised at how our pastures have changed from one year to the next from one season to the next but also from one year to the next how much they have changed and and this one certainly has, has went from brushy weedy species to you know the first time I was there thinking where how much how much is there and, and is it going to sustain that cow or two or three cows that were there at the time because I believe that was before they had the sisters farm uh, to now you know there there's a good amount of forage there and it's good quality forage but yeah they've still got some weeds all of us do this time of year we've all got weeds and whether we choose to manage them one way or another is, is totally up to us but uh, as we were walking this farm we Beth was asking us, you know, what, what is this forage and what's that forage? And, and a lot of what we see now growing on these hillsides where it's went from brush and brambles, now it's it's turned into Kentucky bluegrass. And uh, as we walk down the valley and get to some of the areas that they've grazed the longest, we're starting to see some fescue and some orchard grass and some timothy showing up. And, and that's just the succession of their grazing management. Uh, we probably haven't talked a lot of, with this operation, but they're they're what I would call organic. Um, I'm sure they're not certified in any way. Maybe they are. I, we didn't even discuss it. Why would we? It doesn't matter to us. We're there to look at the grazing operation. Uh, it doesn't matter to me whether you're organic or whether you're conventional. It's all about the management of the forage and the farm and the soil and all those things. Uh, but they, they don't purchase many things in on the operation they especially don't purchase commercial fertilizer and they don't use any herbicides so management is our only and i don't want to say it's our only tool because management is a varying tool of converting this farm from brush to forage species and of course they've used the brush hog where they can most of this farm can't be mowed with a brush hog they use a weed eater uh, to mow back and beat back the brush but they've also used goats over the years they use the sheep now They've got cows that eat the forage and, and it's purely their management that have converted this farm from what it was then to what it is today and will continue to convert it over to better pasture. I have no doubt With within five years we could go back to this farm and other than the steepness in the valley, maybe not recognize it for the difference in the quality of the forage that will be there. You can see out there in the field as you walk it's coming I mean and I'm not saying it's bad it's good now but it's going to get better with time the fescue the orchard grass the bluegrass the timothy they're all coming with them soon the, a lot of legumes will start showing up there's legumes there now but a lot of them will start showing up more and more and taking the place of the brush and holding those areas back and in this particular picture the the left hand side there that's really steep and you can see some kind of weedy species there on the you know that that at one time was a shale bank there was nothing there but shale and now it's growing forage so uh, just a good picture I know I'm getting uh, awfully wordy on this one picture but just a good picture to talk about how our management really drives the quality and composition of our pastures if we walk our pastures and we see things that that we don't like typically those things that we don't like are there because we put them there not purposefully not planted them we put them there based on our management and and we've got to learn to see weeds as as a marker to this is here because of something we did and yeah we can go out there and use a chemical and kill it but if our management is allowing that to continue to to regrow and re-sprout 
it's not doing us a whole lot of good. We've got to look deeper into our management and, and he maybe even vary our management over time uh, to be able to make a real change on the operation. But it can be done. And it can be done with with minimal amount of work compared to some of the other alternatives. As we talk about the grazing management, I'm sure a lot of you that are tuning in from the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council and, and most of you are beef producers, but there's some others among us that you, you're realizing that, that Sean and Beth are what we would consider uh, non-traditional producers. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, they they have their way of doing things and and that's fine and and as a, an NRCS employee you know we work with all comers from conventional to to non-traditional and and there are merits to to every program and and how people want to manage their operation uh, and and my job is to to take the producers goals and and how they want to manage their property and and put it to work, you know, however they, they can do it. And, and Sean and Beth have done a great job at, at managing their, their operation in a, in a more non-traditional way. And there's, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. We appreciate the non-traditional customers as much as we do the, the traditional, more conventional uh, type operations. And, and each one has their own unique management goals, but, but for the most part with the folks that we work with, uh, the goal remains the same. It's it's sustainability, it's profitability, it's uh, <clears throat> raising their family on a farm for the most part. And and where Sean and Beth's kind of goals are unique is is it, it all starts with food sustainability and and works out from there. Again, nothing wrong with that. We appreciate uh, their their view and and their thinking and and we bounce a lot of ideas off of them from time to time uh, about how they would go about managing a particular problem one way or the other. Wanted to include a, a picture of, of the barn that's there at the Salzier farm. There's another uh, building up the row here a ways, but we didn't get a picture of it. But, you know, so often we get caught up with, with our operations and buildings and barns and, and structures and this is, this is what they need to be able to manage their operation. Uh, the pigs are on one side, they've got pens for livestock on the other side, but notice the only thing in the barn right now are, are the pigs and, and uh, very small, but but able to, to keep them and, and do the things that they need to. They milk cows twice a day and, and they milk them in structures like this to be able to, to use it for their family. But just to, to show you the, kind of the minimalist nature that they they have, and, and by all means, I'm not saying that's that's a bad thing. Um, too often we get caught up in, in bulls and barns and sales and, and not enough in our forage and our management and, and how we treat uh, the land and, and how we're making the land better for our operation. And, and I think this picture goes good to, to just show what we can get by with. Some of you after looking at all those pictures said, where's the water? How do they get water to all these pastures, especially in these steep? areas in this steep valley uh, and for those of you that are watching and, and not from these areas you, you would consider this mountainous not just steep and not just a valley uh, but very very steep and and some some people would even consider why why are we even trying why don't we just turn it back to timber but uh, it all goes to management and goals and and what we want to do and and you know historically our, our woodlands were pastoral there were pasture areas or wildlife areas among our trees and so why not this is a good use for this property but as far as water goes uh, you can see the blue tub about halfway up the hill there that's covering a sort of spring box um, they've developed a, a bunch of springs down this valley uh, some of them are good some of them are not so good and they've done it by hand with a shovel and, and done uh, easy quick developments and run them to these uh, tote water totes and that supplies the water to their barn there's another barrel just the other side of that tote that fills up and has an overflow that goes to the creek uh, that that barrel itself has a nipple in it that waters the pigs on the other side of the barn and then they've got a, a, a pump on top of that tote that pumps to the tote that you see up on top that um, little bench area there 
and so they can pump water from this tote to that one up there and then that tote will supply water to the whole valley and so everything's run through pvc or or even garden hoses uh, to get to the livestock as i said we're not dealing with huge numbers here so the, the flow rate's okay that's enough to get them water and uh they've got also some other really interesting uh ways to capture water and and be able to use it for their livestock if the springs go dry they've got a, a kind of a catchment on the other side of a culvert uh, up in the creek and that catchment runs into hoses and brings it down to another tote that they can use for water and, and they can kind of travel those pumps around and be able to do it but you know they don't need a ton of water because they don't have a ton of animals so um, just these simple uh, spring development totes be, and it works flawlessly it's not a system that doesn't work it's not a system that gives them a bunch of trouble it gets them water where they need to go and we had some conversations while we were there too about water and how things go and and you know i i mentioned that i've seen a craze lately for for water wagons and people putting these totes on wagons and hauling them around and and uh, Beth, Beth just said, why, why would you do that to yourself? You can make this work. You can make this work without toting water around, without piping water around. And, and on top of that, you know, if you, you're toting water around, we have to remember how heavy that is. And, and it becomes a, a safety issue, both for pulling a tank of water around and also parking it on these hillsides. Where would you park a water wagon and be able to know that it's still going to be there when you come back again the next time? So, uh, just a quick picture of, of their water system and how they water livestock down the valley. As we were walking around with Sean and Beth here, um, we, we got to talking about the stream. And so often in eastern Ohio, we talk about streams and we talk about fencing off streams. And so many farmers say, if I fenced off the stream, I wouldn't have any farm. And such is the case here. I mean, the stream cut this valley out, and that's why we have what we have. And, and they're proud, and, and we're proud of the way they've been able to manage the stream banks down this stream and still have grass growing up. And, and it's just a good example of when we go out and work with producers, they say, well, you want us to fence off all the streams. And that's not necessarily the case. If we can make things work to where we have forage that goes down to the stream, if we can flash graze those, if we can uh, manage them and not have cows in the stream all the time, we can grow good grass down to the stream's edge and not have the livestock in the stream all the time. This is a perfectly good way to manage the stream banks and manage the stream that flows through the property. You can see the grass growing down, the succession of the plants that are coming up and filling in with good quality forage that can be grazed. And then we can get the animals out of here so that they're not causing us a problem. And you can see as, as best hands both ways, you see no manure in the creek. You see no dead spots in the creek. And, and that's just the indicative of their management and how they've been able to manage this stream flowing through their property. One of the other cool things that Sean and Beth are kind of doing, uh, as I said, the, the goal here is food sustainability. I, I would maintain that their other real goal is is healing the land and leaving it better than they found it and, and doing so in such a way that, that aligns with their goals. Uh, of managing the operation uh, but also they've purchased some i would call them sort of blighted properties as they go down the valley there next to their their operation and i was here and looked at this house several years ago right after they purchased it and i, I gotta be honest my my estimation of what to do with that house would have been to light a batch and walk away and uh that with them and their family's help they have fixed this house up and, and turned it into an airbnb rental now i don't know much about airbnb rentals and how all those things work but uh, what it has become is a uh, another sort of income stream for their operation uh and and outside of that it's become an educational opportunity for them to bring folks uh, from other parts of the country or even locally uh, to their farm and, and show them how animal agriculture works for them and how they do things. And, and I'll maintain also it could become, if they chose to market meat and eggs and milk, which they know because they're, they're fully committed to their food sustainability sort of model. But if they chose, it's, it's a great way to market uh, products by having this Airbnb house here and um, being just a 
simple country boy, I wouldn't think that something like this would really work, especially if you'd asked me about this 10 years ago when I saw this house for the first time. Uh, but uh, they told us when we got there that they had five days that the house wasn't rented in July. And so right now they have eight days that the house isn't rented in August. Uh, it's less than half a mile from downtown Toronto, from a McDonald's, from a Rite Aid, from civilization. But you come up this valley and, and you're in the middle of nowhere to, to folks that, that live somewhere that, it, that is somewhere, I guess. And uh, it's a quiet place for, for folks to come and rent and, and live there and, and be a part of, of an actual farming operation. So I guess it, it's a, a, a good thing to show at a pasture walk that uh, as we talked with Sean and Beth, they, they were talking about, you know, we, we've got to look at our farm and, and how we produce products, but also how we produce income. And, and as a farmer, we have to look at additional income streams uh, that we can utilize and be able to help our overall goals of farming. And, and this is certainly one of the ways that, that they've been able to do that. As we're sort of wrapping up this pasture walk here, uh, I, I thought it was important to include a slide, just a, a cow and some forage and picnic bench in the background. Um, this is down below their Airbnb cabin. But uh, Sean and Beth have put in an immense amount of work on this operation, turning a silk or a sow's ear into a silk purse, so to speak. And uh, it it's, gives me a reminder that we get so caught up in the management and the style and the doing it right and the doing it wrong. And and doing the right thing and, and then profitability enters into it and, and animal numbers and all those things and sometimes it's just good to step back and, and take a look at all, where we've come from and and also where we're going and stop and enjoy the the solitude i guess uh, of the pastures and the animals and and our work and what we've done and and, and i think Sean and Beth have built an operation that allows them to do that. It allows them to, to enjoy the outdoors and the things that, that they've created through their management. And, and I think it's a good reminder to all of us to step back sometimes and, and take a look at where we're at, where we're going, what we're doing, and enjoy that process. Enjoy that that we do. And, uh, be thankful for for the ability to be out and, and be on the land and and manage the land and make a real change in the land and, and it doesn't do us a whole lot of good to to make a change and 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 improve our property if, if we don't have a minute to just sit back and enjoy it and one thing that, that I get from from Sean and Beth and their family is they enjoy the work they are very hard workers and uh but they enjoy the work in such a way that they enjoy just being on the property and being out in the fresh air and sunshine and, and working with livestock so uh just as as a kind of wrapping up here um it's just a good reminder for all of us to to, to take it easy sometimes and, and take a look at what we've done and i think picture here with a picnic table in in the pasture field and and uh just to enjoy what we've got out there on the farm well that's a wrap for this week's pasture walk we do want to send out a heartfelt thank you to sean and beth doherty uh, and their families for allowing us to come down there and and walk around the farm and take up a lot of their time uh, we really enjoyed our visit we always enjoy our visits with them uh, and and they're sort of a uh, different way of thinking not, not that i'm saying that's wrong it, it's it's just fine it, it's it's refreshing to have a, a different sort of view on how we accomplish our grazing goals after that uh thank you all for your comments questions um things that have come to your attention we will also put out a a, a plea for if if you're in another county involved with the eastern ohio grazing council and you've got an idea for someone that could hold a virtual pasture walk. Maybe someone who isn't quite comfortable with having a large group of folks at their farm. 
or doesn't have the parking to be able to have a large group of folks at their farm. We would appreciate having suggestions. We'd appreciate contact information and, and how we can get out there and, and shoot some video. Uh, as things go along here this summer, uh, I'm not quite sure that we're, we're gonna be able to hold in-person pasture walks as things are happening. I hope we are, I remain hopeful, but I'm not sure that we will. So uh, we would be glad to have suggestions of topics and also folks that we could go and visit and, and hold a virtual pasture walk at their operation. With that I'll say we'll see you next time.